There are times when the burdens of life will overwhelm us, bring us to our knees, when we realize how truly weak we are. But it is in our weakness that God reveals his strength. That's our subject today on Truth For Life Weekend, as Alistair Begg continues a study called Life in the Spirit. We're in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. We pick up Paul's argument. He's told us that the creation is groaning. He tells us that the church is groaning. And now, quite remarkably, he tells us that God himself is groaning. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, or alternatively, how we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Amen. Uh, During this past week, I enjoyed the privilege, along with a friend, of listening as a young man whom I'd never met before told us how it was that he came to believe in Jesus, told us how it was that he became a Christian. But the striking thing that he said was that the Holy Spirit essentially took over his life. He didn't use the exact phrase, but that was generally the area in which he spoke. I found that very interesting, and I made note of it because it struck me as being in the same category as the response of a young Asian girl when I asked her in Harvard Square how it was that she'd become a Christian— And on that occasion, she said to me, I entered through the narrow gate. And I always remember that because it was such a striking response. And when I asked this young man, and how did you become a Christian? He said, well, the Holy Spirit invaded my life. And actually, it was very helpful for him to do so. Because although the details of how he arrived at that position were his own, the reality about which he spoke— is a reality which he shares with every other true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to take just a moment this morning to stand back from verses 26 and 27, uh, because there will be some here this morning who have no prior knowledge of chapter 8, or even perhaps a prior knowledge of the Bible at all. So I want you to notice that in verse 9 of chapter 8, the distinguishing mark, or one of the distinguishing marks of a Christian, is that the Spirit of God lives in them. You, however, he says, are not controlled by the sinful nature, which is the state of being unconverted, which is the normal condition of everyday life. We may not like the sound of that, but what the Bible says is we're either controlled by the sinful nature— or else we are controlled by the Spirit of God. By nature, the former is true. By grace, uh, the latter becomes a reality. He says in verse 15 that we've been adopted into God's family. We're no longer aliens and strays. And in verse 16, he says the Spirit of God within us actually testifies with our spirit that we are God's children— So this is something very different from an individual who says, I have an interest in theology, or I like to read about spiritual things, or I am an attender at a local congregation, all of which is a matter of interest and maybe some help. But this is something very, very different from all of that, namely that the Spirit testifies within us, within the real you and the real me— that we are actually the children of God, that we have become something that we weren't before. And in the case of this young man, he says, that's what happened to me. The Spirit of God invaded my life, and I became his child. Well, I wonder, has the Spirit of God invaded your life? And would you be able to testify in the same way? Now, as we've gone through these studies, we've seen that the reality of this experience— is one that takes us down the same path as that which was walked by Jesus. And in verse 
uh, 17, we are children, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might share in his glory. And you have this juxtaposition between suffering and glory. Some people have an idea that Christianity exists to take men and women out of the realm of suffering and bring them into the realm of tranquility or of ease, somehow or another to fly above and beyond all of the turbulence of life. And that's why they seek it out, and when they find that that hasn't happened, then they turn away from it and they say, well, it's no use at all. I might as well have got a self-help book from the library and tried to fix myself for all the help that that was, because I thought I was going to be done with all of these things. And I've been listening to some Christians, and it sounds as though their life has become much harder since they became followers of Jesus than it ever was before. How could that be? Well, because the path of discipleship is the path that Jesus walked. He walked the path of suffering into the realm of glory. Now, the word glory is an interesting word, isn't it? You don't really uh, find it used very often, except in Christian circles. I know someone would say it is a glorious sunset, or that was a glorious meal, but even then I don't think it's used very often, even as an adjective, and certainly not as a noun. And since we're using it, and since it's an important word here, we ought to understand what Paul is talking about. And essentially it is this, that glory is the outward manifestation or the outward shining of the invisible God. That God's glory or God's character and his power and his majesty, which are all invisible to us, become visible as he makes himself known. There is a glory that attaches to creation. That when you stand and you look up into the night sky and you realize the vastness of the, the, the solar system there, and you look up into the galaxy that is our Milky Way, you find yourself saying, this is something far greater than anything we have ever known. You take a tiny child in your arms and you look at the way that they are so intricately fashioned. This speaks to God's glory, because one of the ways in which God has manifested his glory is in the creation, not just in the creation of uh, our world and our cosmos, but in the individual creation of you and me. You have been made in the image of God. And one of the ways that the invisible God becomes visible is in his creation. Well, you say, but isn't the creation or the visibility of God somewhat marred in our lives. Good. The answer is yes. And the Bible tells us why. And if you would like to take a moment, I want to show you how Paul traces this argument here, even in Romans. And you need to go back to Romans chapter 1 and to verse 21, where Paul is describing the fact that although men and women knew God— new God. Atheism is a choice. Atheism is a decision. Atheism is an act of rebellion. No one is born an atheist. Everyone is born with an innate knowledge of God. Men and women choose to deny the existence of God. Contemporary atheism wants to suggest that we were all born atheistic, and a few crazy individuals have chosen to invent the notion of a creator. The Bible says no. And here Paul explains, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. Ingratitude is always a mark of ungodliness. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened, Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged, and here's our word, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. 
So what he's saying is that when God made man, when he made Adam and Eve, he made them in his image. Adam and Eve turn their back on God, they disobey God, and the image of God is now marred in humanity. And at the heart of that is idolatry. It is the worship of someone or something other than the Creator to whom we are accountable. And these substitute gods are as prevalent in 21st century Western culture as they were in the cultures of Mesopotamia and Assyria and the Amalekites and so on, all the way through the journey that is given to us in the Bible. Misdirected worship is at the heart of it. When Paul then takes this forward, he says in chapter 3 and in verse 23, that there's actually no difference between the Gentile person who's in this predicament or the Jewish person who's in this predicament. That's really what he's been arguing. He argues the Gentile situation in Romans 1, and then he says, but there's no peculiar advantage to you actually being a Jew, since you, even in your Judaism, substitute gods for the true and living God. And then he gets to it in verse 23. There's no difference, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us gives to God the glory that he deserves, despite the fact that, as the Scottish Catechism tells us, the chief end of man, the reason for our existence, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Made in his image, we possess a dignity that is distinct from the beasts. As sinners, that dignity is marred. And as a result of that, our reach always exceeds our grasp. Paul then comes to the solution, and wonderfully so, when he gets to chapter 5. And what he's been pointing out is that the exchange that we have made, exchanging God's glory for the shameful substitutes, is an exchange that is more than matched by the exchange of God himself, who has in Jesus exchanged all the glory that he knows in heaven for all the shame and the poverty and the dirtiness and the sinfulness of earth. And that the great exchange that man has made in substituting himself for God has been addressed by the great exchange that God has made in substituting himself for man. So that Jesus takes the place of the sinner on the cross, thereby making a reality acceptance with God for all who are trusting in his provision. And that's why in chapter 5 he says, in light of this, and this is to summarize four chapters, he says, therefore being justified by faith, not by anything that we have done, being justified by faith, faith in what? Faith in this great exchange that God has provided in Jesus a Savior— Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, present tense, peace with God. We have access into this grace in which we stand now, and here we go, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And what he's actually doing there is he's setting the scene for that to which he comes back here in chapter 8. Not only are we going to see God's glory, but God's glory is going to be seen in us. When John writes about this in 1 John, he says, and we know that when we see him, we will be like him. Now, Paul has been addressing this in this chapter 8, and he's been pointing out to his readers, and we are his readers, that uh, the messed up nature of our world has to do with the fact that we are messed up. We've got a broken down world because we are broken down people. The nature of the breakdown is the breakdown in relationships between ourselves and God, our Creator. Instead of us going to the provision that the Creator has made for us, we go to our own little creations, seeking somehow or another to make sense of our lives, 
to fill up our days with the adoration of that which is less than what God has intended. And hence the futility and the sense of emptiness that pervades things. It is then in light of this that he tells us in verse 22 that the creation is groaning, that in verse 23 the people of God are groaning, and that in verse 26, and here is the wonder of wonders, beneath our groanings, God himself is groaning. And what he describes in verses 26 and 27 is phenomenal. It is mysterious. It is wonderful. It is almost beyond our ability to grasp. Namely, that what we have described for us here is the groaning of God praying to God. God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who now lives within the life of a believer, speaking to God the Father in and through the prayers and the cries and the intercessions of those who are his children. You see how different Christianity is from most notions of spirituality and and world religions? Every day we live our lives, the great attempt is to flatten onto one terrain any notion of a God or gods or an interest in God or awareness of God or whatever else it is. And Christianity stubbornly refuses to be pressed down into that milieu, not on account of arrogance, but on account of the inevitability of the fact that the claims of Christianity stand out as being so unbelievable as to almost demand that we would consider them as true. Now, we're at verse 26, and I think you'll be relieved about that, because that's where we should be. And it is here that we're told that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He's been describing life in the Spirit. It is the Spirit that is at work in creation. It is the Spirit that is at work in our lives. And it is the Spirit now who helps us in our weakness. Let's address this in two ways. First of all, acknowledging this to be true generally— and then acknowledging it to be true specifically in the context that Paul gives us here. Paul uh, has been very clear concerning the nature of weakness, and classically so in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 12. And as he reaches the apex of his argument, he says in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited or from getting a big head— because, he said, I've had revelations of God that are so unbelievable that I couldn't even begin to talk about them. And that could give me a sense of dominance and priority and so on. And God, recognizing that, to keep me from getting a big fat head, he gave me a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what it is. If we needed to know, we would have been told. We know that it was a torment to him and something that he would like to be rid of. He'd asked the Lord three times if he would take it away from him, and three times the answer came back, no, because, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, he says, therefore, deduction, if that's the case, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. For, he says— when I am weak, then I am strong. It's paradoxical, isn't it? It's ironic. Especially when you set it within the context of 21st century America. Because the one thing that you're not supposed to admit to is weakness. Everyone is a winner in America. In a book called Nurture Shock, New Thinking About Children, the book says modern parents are wanting to nurture so skillfully that Mother Nature will gasp in admiration at the marvels their parenting produces from the soft clay of children. 
The assumption is that thinking highly of oneself is a prerequisite for high achievement. And that's why, uh, and some of you have actually started to do this, you put little notes in the lunchbox of your children telling them they're a genius. The fact that they didn't finish their cereal, that they left a room a royal shambles, and that they've been a pain in your neck for the last seven days didn't stop you because you have imbibed so much of the spirit of the age that you actually believe that this is the key to the well-being and the future of your child. Let me tell you what is the key to the effectiveness and well-being of your child. The discovery of their own personal inadequacy. And the discovery that in that inadequacy, there is the opportunity for growth and for achievement. Peggy Noonan, writing in the Wall Street, 2009, July 2009, she writes, For 30 years, the self-esteem movement told the young they're perfect in every way. It's yielding something new in history, an entire generation with no proper sense of inadequacy. We're not talking about a wrong sense of inadequacy. We're talking about a proper sense of inadequacy. The proper sense of inadequacy that comes when you jump rope with ropes and you realize you're a klutz. And you realize that when you saw uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard doing that thing, and you tried it, you look like the village idiot. That's fine. You're not Sugar Ray Leonard. You're not going to be. Relax. He probably can't do many of the things you do. But you see, the reason I mention this is because if we're going to read our Bibles, and we're going to allow our Bibles to speak into our, the world in which we live, then we need to identify the world in which we live and bring it into contrast or confluence with the instruction of Scripture. Help in our weakness. That's the title of our message today from Alistair Begg on Truth For Life Weekend. It's part of our series called Life in the Spirit. Maybe you were thinking today about someone you'd like to share this message with, or maybe you'd like to revisit previous messages in this study. You can find these and other resources available free of charge at our website, truthforlife.org. While you're there, be sure to take a look at our current featured resource as well. It's a book that Alistair personally recommends, a brand new release from a respected author and pastor, Tim Savage. The book is called Discovering the Good Life. Tim Savage reminds us that though many of us are merely surviving this journey of life, God's intent for us is to actually thrive in this life. Tracing the theme of three trees found in the landscape of Scripture, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, the shoot from the stump of Jesse, that's Jesus, and then the tree of life in Revelation, Tim points beyond survival to show us how we find true riches in Christ. If you want to see what an abundant life is supposed to look like, and if you want to be motivated to start living the abundant life, this is a book you will really appreciate. We'd love to send you a copy. Learn how you can request Discovering the Good Life when you visit truthforlife.org. That's truthforlife.org. While you're there, you can also request your copy of the 10 Years of Favorites USB. It's our most extensive compilation of Alistair's teaching, 123 messages featuring teaching from dozens of books of the Bible, also many topical sermons. Request your copy, maybe one to pass on to a friend, when you visit truthforlife.org slash 10. I'm Bob Lapine. Next time, Alistair continues his study in the book of Romans, describing how God provides help in our weakness. Be sure to join us. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.